Now, industrialization and industrial policy, that is uh, currently a conversation uh, on debate, uh, and the EFF has weighed in on this. They've said this, if correctly applied, is a fundamental prerequisite for a developmental and redistributive project that must create jobs, defeat poverty, and reduce inequality. Those are the words of the Deputy President of the Economic Freedom Fighters and uh, Parliamentary Chief Whip, Floyd Shibambu, who is my guest tonight as we unpack this and various other issues. To be a part of the conversation, do tag us at Newsroom405 on Twitter or WhatsApp us your questions and comments on 072-110-5584. We'll get into that conversation. Uh, Floyd, good evening and thank you very much for your time. No, good evening and uh, good evening to your viewers. We are a nation, I uh, will start there, that is uh, struggling uh, with a plethora of issues, um, inadequate economic growth, widespread unemployment. We heard the figures even now uh, are released by Statistics South Africa that there's more people, 1.4 more million more people who are uh, unemployed. We're talking about sharp inequalities, which I'm sure you will want to add. It's not just inequality, but it is racial uh, in its nature in terms of who are the ones who are left behind uh, and then of course we're talking about low levels of, of investment but overall what is your view of where we are now as a country are we descending into a demoralized land uh, of disorder and decay or is there something positive to pick out Look, we have got a deep crisis in South Africa of uh, underdevelopment when underdevelopment is understood in context. Because underdevelopment basically refers to the fact that we do not have an expanded productive economic sector which produces goods and products for domestic and global consumption. So that is what defines South Africa's economy. There is much emphasis and focus on raw and semi-processed goods and products that are exported to the other parts of the world. And then the world brings finished goods and products for our consumption. So virtually everything else that we consume here in South Africa is produced elsewhere. And even in the small parts of areas where we try to manufacture, we mostly focus on assembling of uh, motor vehicles, the automobile industry, mostly made of components that come from other parts of the world. So if we were to check just how much components are used to manufacture BMW, Mercedes-Benz, Toyota, in the over-subsidized industries here in South Africa, we realize that uh, more than 70% of those are made outside of South Africa. We are just assembling point uh, of, of those products. And in, 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 in most instances, these industries are refusing to localize the local components that are supposed to create the necessary jobs that are needed. At the center of South Africa's underdevelopment and poverty is the fact that we do not have quality jobs, particularly in the manufacturing sector. That is why we argued in parliament uh, during the state of nation address that we need to decisively pursue industrialization because it is that form of economic policy that will take us out of the poverty crisis that defines us. But also there's been several observations by, by, by observation of history, by economists, by literally everyone who is rational to say that you cannot shortcut the route to economic transformation and development except through pursuit of industrialization. So that is what we need to do in South Africa. And at the center of that is an appreciation that a proper industrial policy will thereafter determine the kind of trade policies that we adopt as a country. It will determine the form and content of fiscal, co of, of fiscal policy, uh, the manner in which government allocates its resources for different purposes. It will therefore uh, determine the form of monetary policy. Where do we tag our currency in relation to the, the most the dominant currencies in the world. It also informs educational policy broadly. It informs energy policy. It informs our foreign policy. So in South Africa, there is directionlessness in, in regard to industrialization because the, the those that are leading that uh, aspect of our economy think that industrialization is to export avocados and lemons and oranges 
and, 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 and basic agricultural products. And that has proven uh, for a very long time now, not only for South Africa, but for most African and underdeveloped economies, that if you base your economy on the exportation of raw and semi-processed, even agricultural products, you are not going to be able to decisively deal with the unemployment and therefore the poverty question that defines any nation state. So that is why we are arguing very strongly as the economic freedom fighters, an argument which is contained in our founding manifesto that we need to pursue massive industrialization to create millions of jobs and, and, and not be a dependent neo-colonial economy that we currently are in the in the current circumstances. So that is the, that is basically the argument yeah. that we're making that, that we need to defeat poverty. What, 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 what is your, your assessment, your quick assessment of, of why since 1994 to today with uh, political power, however you might argue it was partial political power, we have not built uh, factories that produce South African products the size of uh, your ESCO. I mean, we do have ESCOM. Uh, we know the challenges that are there. Uh, we've got many other SOEs and the challenges that are going on there. But what has prevented us and kept us from coming up with uh, or building actually factories that uh, produce South African product at that scale and promote South African brands? You know, it's, it's not only just the inability to build new industries that has defined the post-1994 government. It has actually been a deliberate de-industrialization because, you know, like for evil purposes, what the apartheid government had done was to adopt something called the Good Hope Plan for Southern Africa, which was a, an, an, an instrument for influx control because these whites wanted to create South Africa as a whites only country. So to control the movement of people from the rural areas, then they tried to introduce industries in most uh, in different parts of South Africa, in Umtata, in Shiho, in Bochabela, uh, in, in Sibasa, in uh, former vendor Bantustan, in Palabora, in many other parts of South Africa. But when the post-1994 government took office, they adopted what is broadly called the neoliberal economic policies, which said that government must not protect industries. They must not subsidize them. They must not give them tax breaks. They must instead integrate into the global economy to compete with a much more advanced industrialized nations. And that led to the closure of so many industries that had existed here in South Africa. And we could have repurposed all those industrial zones to continue to create jobs in South Africa, but also explore further industries. There's an attempt now through the special economic zones to build industrialization in South Africa, but by all measure and standards, all the special economic zones that have been developed in, in collective assessment they are a dismal failure, they are a dismal miscarriage because all of them that exist now have not created more than 20,000 jobs, have not received major financial fiscal injection from the state to produce as many goods and products that are needed for our own domestic consumption, but also for exportation to the African economy and to other parts of the world. So they, they, the neoliberalism, of the post-1994 government is what is at the center of our underdevelopment, our poverty, our, our joblessness, and of course the rising inequalities. And, 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 and that, is, that is what we are dealing with in the South African context, that you do not have a government that appreciates that at the center of any economic development model, you need to industrialize, your economy must protect, the sectors that are still struggling. If you were to gauge and study all the developed nationalized nations, except the oil producing countries that are not as heavily industrialized, they use the revenue from the oil and other natural resources, the gas, to develop their societies. But in, 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 in almost all cases, industrialization lies at the center of economic development and, 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 and you need a decisive state that protects those industries. Like I can give several examples, but the one that we currently use is the one of Toyota. Toyota 
currently produces more than 10 million cars per year. And, and, and at its inception, Toyota was heavily protected, protected by the Japanese government. Actually, for the first 30 years of the existence of Toyota, it was not a profit-making corporation because it, it was still trying to integrate into a highly competitive automobile space in the world. But the Japanese government was able to protect it. It is now at the core and the center of the Japanese economy, which is uh, presently the, the third, if not fourth, uh, largest economy in the world. If you gauge all other countries that got to industrialize, like South Korea, Malaysia, uh, uh, parts of China, which is called Taiwan and Hong Kong, all of them, they get to catch up to the developed nations because of protected industrial expansion. That is also defining the Chinese economy. The Chinese economy in 1980 was possibly number 80th uh, biggest economy in the world. It's currently the second biggest economy in the world because of a decisive pursuit of industrial expansion. But here in South Africa, we continue to primarily and, 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 and mostly produce raw and semi-processed goods and services, assemblage uh, uh, points, whilst we import the uh, all finished goods and products, which otherwise were going to create jobs for millions of South Africans. So what that means is that our consumption here in South Africa, including by the state, is creating jobs for many other economies and not ourselves who need those jobs the most. That is what we are then dealing with in this particular policy framework. And, and, and unless we appreciate that we are not going to deal with the poverty question through industrialization, we are not going to go anywhere. We're going to be stuck in the same conditions because it is not guaranteed that with the passage of time, a country will develop forward. There are so many countries which with the passage of time, they have been defined by underdevelopment and backward movement, poverty deepening, the infrastructure deteriorating, and a variety of things which are easy, quick wins are not being achieved. So if you were to check a lot of post-colonial nations in the African continent, you will realize that they are getting worse and worse because they have not pursued a decisive industrial policy and strategy that gets to create sustainable jobs for, for their own people. And that is the path that South Africa is taking because when we raise these issues in parliament, the Minister of Trade and Industry gloats about the fact that there is a poultry farm yeah. A, I, 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 want, I want to talk to that. I'm going to take a break. When we come back, I yes. want you to talk about this concept of master plans, automotive master plan, poultry master plan, textile master plan, why you think those are not going to, to work. We continue in a moment with the Deputy President of the Economic Freedom Fight. And our continued conversation now with the Deputy President of the EFF, Floyd Shivambu. You can be a part of the conversation on Twitter. Send us a tag at Newsroom405 or you can WhatsApp your questions and your comments now to 072-110-5584. Before the break, we were outlining some of the failings as far as our ability to industrialize the economy uh, of South Africa. Now, Floyd, I said before the break, I want us to talk about the tools that we are currently thinking of using, one of which is um, uh, the master plans, uh, textile master plan, poultry master plan, uh, automotive master plan, a number of them, I think, uh, that 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 uh, the president also outlined during the State of the Nation address. Are you saying we are lacking as far as tools of foresight, uh, or are we just plainly failing to plan? Look, I, I, I think before we deal with the master plans, I think what the South African government needs to do is to draw a very solid distinction between air manufacturing policy and the exportation of agricultural products. Because the manner in which it's being handled now, the government is confusing the exportation of citrus products, of agricultural products, as if those are the products of industrial policy. I think we need to distinguish that to say that let us focus maybe separately on the manufacturing policy to say, what do we manufacture? Because if you export citrus products, you have not manufactured anything really. If you export chickens, you have just slaughtered them, you have not manufactured them uh, and refrigerated them and then you send them to the sea in terms of what happens. It's more or less similar to 
what we're doing with majority of our natural and mineral resources. So we need to have a clear plan on how do we industrialize and manufacture goods and products domestically. Now let's give a proper critique of this automobile uh, uh, master plan. So what, what they're basically saying is that let us have a plan for German cars, for Japanese cars, for American cars. So the, the president even prides himself that he will visit a Ford assemblage point in Pretoria that Ford has invested in South Africa, highly subsidized far lesser tax than all other investors that are here in South Africa, even against uh, domestic businesses. Why is South Africa not manufacturing its own civilian cars? Because if you were to check in the list of the products that are manufactured by Dinel, a state-owned manufacturing company, includes armored vehicles, it includes guns, it includes fighter jets. Why are we not using that capacity to manufacture civilian vehicles that in the immediate can be utilized by state procurement. How many police vans does South Africa have? How many cars do municipalities own? How many uh, ambulances do we need in our hospital system, which we can domestically make here in South Africa and create a lot of jobs? We currently have got 12 million cars here in South Africa, which are registered by the Department of Transport. And majority of those are imported from other parts of the world. And those that are made in South Africa are made through imported uh, components uh, for, for those particular vehicles. So we're not maximally coming with a clear plan to create jobs through even state procurement. So the state can be the biggest driver for industrialization in South Africa if there was some degree of willingness. And not only in the automobile sector, in the electronic sector, in the home appliances. Just how many fridges do we have in South Africa? How many microwaves? How many television sets? How many cell phone products do we have? How many computers do we have? We, 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 we are all of those are bringing from other parts of the world whilst if we're building local capacity to manufacture uh, those products, we're going to create a lot of jobs. Just how much furniture comes out of South Africa into our economy for, for hospitals, for schools, for household usages. We are not focusing on those areas, even for our own consumption, because there is commercial viability for these major retailers to bring those as finished goods and products, but undermining the necessary jobs creation a, a purpose, which is at the center of dealing with the a, 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 a poverty question yeah. and thereafter inequality because the pursuit of industrialization as well must not happen outside of the deracialization and transformation of who owns and controls all these sectors. It must not be us celebrating that we have brought Japanese investors uh, and, and, and German investors and American investors with our people who now have got some degree of capacity can own these products. For, for many years, South African workers have been producing cars on behalf of German automakers like BMW and Audi and, uh, and, and VW. And we've been producing cars for, 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 for the Japanese in the form of Toyota. We're now bringing uh, the cars from India for assembling point. But if we were to focus on the internal capacity, we could make our own viable and competitive automobiles in a way that yeah. is going to compete with the world. But also there is a huge market in the African continent. That is why when we speak about continental integration, it's, it feeds directly to that purpose of massive yeah. industrialization now, here in South Africa, now, 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 knowing now, that we have to integrate with the entire continent. There's a feeling of the voices that are saying the reason why we are not even beginning to get to a point of thinking about these issues is because of the nature of our politics in the country that have been largely now patronage-driven politics of the stomach uh, and uh, networks that are more interested in their own financial rewards. Do you, do you think we are at that point in our politics where uh, the, 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 the stomach is what is thriving and ruling uh, and I suppose also lawlessness beginning to emerge? Look, the reality is that for a very long time, we have got politicians in the ruling party who are not different from uh, uh, rappers, from hip-hop uh, 
artist who are saying, you must get rich or die trying. That is what they are looking for. And the quick wins for them is those tenders of giving supplier contracts to huge manufacturers of uh, vehicles to supply them with almost all vehicles without investing in the necessary painful but highly beneficial form of industrial expansion, which is much more sustainable for the future. We cannot continue to be a neo-colonial economy because we want to please the immediate interest of politicians. We know that in the process of procuring immediate goods for quick commercial purposes, they're going to receive bribes from the establishment. It's a problematic model that is going to later on underdevelop our economy. And where does the risk come from? Because if you rely on uh, these foreign investors as, as the anchor of your industrialization, they can go anywhere, any day, even if you have not done anything wrong. They can be given better in incentives in Rwanda. They, been, they can be given better incentives in Vietnam. In China can say that, Toyota, why don't you just come and manufacture all your cars in China? And then they can just leave KwaZulu uh, uh, Natal and, and the jobs that are created there will automatically disappear. They can just pack up their things and go because the, there is not a, a degree of state control and the patriotism that you need in the pursuit of industrialization. So that is the problematic notion that has defined South Africa's politics and economy for a very long time. And we as a generation, we need to discontinue that pattern of neocolonialism. We need to decolonize the economy. And decolonization of the economy means that we must begin to produce our own goods and product and, 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 and of course, expand the intercontinental integration that is going to make sure that all Africans are participating in the entire value chain of producing goods and services that we need. Are you currently making a, a meaningful contribution in the debate that's currently going on around the erosion of trust in, in our societal institutions? What is your assessment? Look, the, the, the trust in institutions and distrust in institutions is definitive of politics in history. Since the beginning of politics, they, it's almost natural to distrust public representatives. It's, it's almost always the case. So if you were to gauge what were the perception of corruption in the 1970s when South Korea was beginning to much more aggressively pursue industrialization, South Korea was viewed as the most corrupt country in the world because of a decisive move towards that particular direction. Generally, you will know that, and correctly so, members of society must always question the decisions that are taken by public representatives. But that does not mean that decisions must not be taken, that we must not take decisions that are going to be intergenerationally sound, that are going to intergenerationally benefit our people, that are going to create jobs and make sure that we've got intergenerational wealth that is going to benefit uh, our people. But the current model that we have is problematic and we cannot be scared because there will always be worries and concerns and partisan uh, queries about whether what we're pursuing is correct or not. That is a permanent feature of politics all over the world. There is no politician in the world, not even Nelson Mandela, who will enjoy like a, a, a wholesome approval. It doesn't happen anyway, but that does not sub, sub, substitute the fact that we should take decisive action to build industries that are going to create jobs for our people. And, and, and linked to that is the fact that we need to equitably redistribute our land. And that can only happen once we have repossessed the entirety of South Africa from the colonial settlers who continue to majority own South Africa's land. Yeah. I mean, do you think, for example, I mean, you, you've made a comment, but you can also tell me if indeed you still stand by this comment and it did come from you, at least it's been reported somewhere. For example, an institution or a, 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 a commission set up like the Zondo Commission, we called it a, a, a commission and Zondo are following a misguided political agenda uh, and are failing to nail down the corruption uh, accused Gupta family and, and associates. Those kinds of comments, do you think they contribute towards the erosion of trust in our institutions? Look, the, uh, 
we have made very correct observations about the direction that the Zondo Commission is taken thus far. It, it looks like it's a fishing expedition. You remember that we are the ones as the economic freedom fighters that went to court to make sure that the report of the public protect at that time is released against what was investigations of Gupta's capture of Jacob Zuma's presidency. And then when later on there was a refusal to establish a commission, it's us as the economic freedom fighters who went to court to say that let us have this commission established and that the president must not play a central role in identifying whoever presides there. It's us who went to court to make sure that this commission is established. But when they are failing to give a clearer and detailed content and context of what was the original investigation, they are now on a fishing expedition. They're looking for virtually everything else. And most of the areas they're looking to is issues that could be dealt with by South Africa's criminal justice system. If there is corruption that has to be dealt with in relation to all these, these hearings that are being entertained there, the criminal justice system is well capacitated to deal with those issues. But the manner in which the commission has been happening now has been a fishing expedition and majority of times, its observations, its politics coincide with politics of a faction in government, the faction in the ANC of the cabal of Pravin Godan that seeks to criminalize all black business people that seeks to undermine any efforts by black people to regain okay. their economy or to participate in, in procurement because it is not automatic that if you procure with the state as a black person, you are a corrupt person. They are of course people who are doing wrong things. Those must be acted upon decisively, but you cannot have a permanent unending commission that is in a fishing expedition uh, to, to, to even fight political battles when we have a criminal justice system that can deal with some of the issues that it has overextended itself to then deal with. All right, if we go straight now to some of the questions that uh, you have been asking uh, uh, this evening uh, to the Deputy President of the Economic Freedom Fighters. This one is coming from Tabo in Pretoria saying, EFF is advocating for one Africa. Wouldn't the, that strain our already strained economic emancipation if we were to host the whole continent here in South Africa? Because most African countries, people assume the party says uh, uh, all must come down and settle in this part of the world. Now, uh, won't that take us back in terms of economic development and further stretch the inequalities that we are currently facing? Let's take another one. Good evening from Jabula in Midrand uh, saying, if I may ask Mr. Shivambu this question, what is their take on President Jacob Zuma's defiance on the constitutional court order uh, to appear at the Zondo Commission? What will they what will what will be their assistance to make sure that Zuma appears at the commission so we can hear his side of the story? All right, let's get into those questions. So Floyd, let's let's talk first and foremost about uh, the this idea of uh, illegal immigration in the country. How, how do you make sure that uh, uh, South Africans uh, uh, who are disadvantaged continue to get opportunities, uh, that certain jobs uh, are reserved and particularly prioritize them as opposed to going to uh, uh, migrants in the country who are in illegally? And do, 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 do you believe that this is somewhat of a, 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 an issue for those who are supporters of the EFF but they part with you? when you come to that particular point? No, I, I think the question which was asked there was talking about uh, whether we want to allow people to come and reside in this part of the African continent. No, that is not what we're advocating for. So most people are radically defined by the deliberate uh, misapprehension of the EFF's call and correct demand for continental integration because Wame Nkrumah is correct in observing that these small and viable economic states in the continent make it impossible to globally integrate into the economy of global capitalism in a manner in which it is designed. That if you are going to have different systems, 54 or 52 different systems in the African continent, which do not have infrastructure that links in for trade purposes from uh, Cape 
to Cairo, you are not going to have a real development. What happens currently in the African continent is that almost all the former colonies, they trade primarily with their former colonizers. And our call is that we need to break that decolonial segregation, which had defined us in those particular borders. We need to have continental integration where there must be free movement of goods. Well, there is now a signed the Africa Free Trade Agreement. But how are you going to realize that if every time people wants to trade with each other in the African continent, they must apply for a visa that takes three, four weeks, or even a month. Yeah. How do you achieve that if you still have these barriers in terms of the communications infrastructure? So the integration of the African economy is at the center of our far much more dependable and sustainable economic development. That has defined the European economic community. That has defined the Asian economy in, in most instances. The, the integration is at the center of sustainable yeah. and dependable development. But, but, but what, what, what do you make, what do you make of the growing What we're advocating for is that everyone else must come into South Africa. It is not the case. What, we are what, what, what do you make of the call that us, says... all of us put, develop put, the African economy. Yeah, I mean, that, that says put South Africa first. And this is a call that's coming mainly from uh, men who are feeling left out of the mainstream. And they are the ones who are shouting a lot, saying, well, put South Africa first. Do you know they put, a, put South Africa first the notion majority of the time? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very backward uh, colonial uh, campaign of, of mostly people who do not appreciate that. It is not practical. It will never be possible to develop South Africa's economy without developing the immediate economy. So when Japan was rapidly developing, it realized that for it to gain access to the immediate markets in South Korea, it must play a role in the development of the South Korean economy so that when they produce cars in Japan, they must be able to have somewhere to trade those cars. The Marshall Plan after the Second World War, which, which redeveloped Europe, was driven by the United States and even funded by the United States because they wanted to have a market upon which they would trade their products in mostly part of the Western Europe. So to think that we can just develop this small enclave called South Africa without looking into the development of Lesotho, of Zambia, of Malawi, of Namibia, of Zimbabwe, of all the countries in the subcontinent, it's, it's just not economically sustainable, it's not viable. And people will always migrate for social economic purposes. And, 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 and that, that defines the world. South Africa currently has got almost a million people in, in the United Kingdom yeah. for, for social economic purposes. Yeah. So, so migration has always been part of the world. You cannot ignore that. Yeah. The issue is how do you regulate it in a way that it's not concentrating people into one area. If you want to avoid that, you must appreciate that your development as a nation should include the development of your neighbors. You must, you must play a role in the development of economic infrastructure, and opportunities in all the economies. And South Africa is strategically placed to play that role in terms of the expansion of our energy plan to the entire continent, of our transportation plan, a railway that must integrate the entire continent so that we've got a far much more viable economy than this segregated, a colonially defined economy. We cannot pride ourselves that we call ourselves with names that were defined by colonialists, and very recently, like 200 years, uh, not more than 300 years ago, when they came to say, you are Zimbabwean, you are Lesotho, you are Namibian, and everything else. That, that is not what we were. Africans, even prior to the arrival of colonialists, always migrated from one place to another for seasonal purposes, for, for economic purposes. Yeah. We need to handle it in a much more sustainable and sophisticated way now, which will develop the entirety of the African continent. If you, if, if anyone thinks that we can develop uh, to the ex exception and to the exclusion of the entire African continent, that then person lives in a dreamland. Let's take the other question then. Uh, let's start it this way. Do you still believe that the former president, uh, uh, Jacob Zuma, was involved in what you would like to call 
the group, the criminal syndicate, and therefore should go and appear before the Zondo Commission. And what are you going to do to, to contribute towards him appearing? Yes, we do. We, 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 we still believe that he must go and appear before the Zondo Commission and, uh, and provide answers on all the allegations that were leveled against him. And, and despite whatever are, are the, the speculations of uh, mostly mainstream and regional media, the commander in chief of the economic freedom fighters became statesman and, and took a decisive decision, which contrary to many speculations was about saying, President Zuma must appear before the commission. He must not defy the rule of law. That is essentially what we stand for. We have never shifted in terms of that particular principle. We think that he must still be held accountable if he has got concerns about how the commission is conducting itself. He must subject that to judicial review in the upper courts, in the, in the, in the, in the other system of the judiciary that are, are not uh, determined by the commission. And that is, that, is, that is what we believe in, and there's never been any shift in that particular regard. Uh, we, we, of course, will not entertain any other speculative nonsense that has uh, got to define what we stand for. Right. Now, there uh, is a tweet from uh, the uh, president of the Economic Freedom Fighters that uh, says uh, the uh, CR-17 uh, unsealing the, the bank statements uh, uh, case is going ahead, I think, sometime in mid March. My question, I mean, I'm looking forward to, to hearing what that case is going to actually reveal. But my question to you uh, is, do you say that as an indication that you still believe in the uh, judicial justice system of the country? Otherwise, you wouldn't be going there. And are you prepared to accept the outcome of whatever it is comes out of there, whether uh, it goes your way or doesn't go your way? Yeah, the EFF always uh, believes in the rule of law, and, and that doesn't take away our right to criticize uh, specific judges that take inconsistent decisions, decisions that are inconsistent with the law. We believe in the rule of law. That is why we are going to court. We, when, when we're called upon by courts, even for irrational charges, we go and appear. Uh, so, so we believe in the rule of law, and that is why even this case, which is taken up by the EFF, is going to be heard in a court of law. We still believe in the courts of law here in South Africa, and if they take irrational decisions, we will elevate that to the higher levels of courts to uh, subject whatever decisions that you are not satisfied with to review. That is what defines us as the organization. We will only take far much more ultra judicial mechanisms if we are prevented from exercising our rights within the constitutional democracy. That is why our constitution and founding manifesto says that if needs be, we will take power through whatever revolutionary means possible. And that means that if there is no democratic space that is provided, there's no constitutional rule of law that is provided in South Africa, we'll use whatever means necessary and possible to take political power in South Africa. Now, there is, uh, uh, of course, already out there, it's, it's a debate that's going on uh, publicly of uh, the fact that you already have access to the CR-17 campaign documents uh, and you know where that amount of money went to or to who. Why are you going to cause to have those uh, uh, unsealed? We do not have access to the CR-17 uh, 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 funding uh, accounts. We do not have access to that. If we did, we we're not going to waste time to go to court. We would have released them by now for everyone else to see. But the principle is that a court has taken a decision to officially seal those records, meaning that anyone who gains access to those documents without the approval of a court will be violating, violating the, the court ruling that those uh, documents and details must be sealed. So we are going to court to then officially release those documents so that we can know who has funded Cyril Ramaphosa to buy the ANC conference, to buy the presidency of the ANC so that he can buy the presidency of the country. And what is the relationship of those people that funded Cyril Ramaphosa 
with current state procurement? Are the people who are manufacturing vaccines in Port Elizabeth part of those that funded him? Are the people who are benefiting from the independent power producers and this renewable energy approach, are they benefiting from uh, uh, this because they funded Dharmaposa? Those are the issues that we want to reveal so that we know what we're dealing with. We do not want a president that is thriving on secrecy and hiding of information whilst on the other side is busy giving government tenders and contracts to the friends that bought the ANC conference on his behalf. So are you saying when you make those statements, for example, like you say, well, the IPPs are really all about uh, those who funded the, the CR17 campaign and they are benefiting from it. Are you saying those statements without actually the surety that indeed those are the people who funded and they got the benefit? Or are you sure that those are the people who got funded and got the benefit? That is, that is, that is what, that is what, that is what we're going to court to, to unveil. That is why we're going to court. We want to see who are the funders there. We want to see because here is a president who doesn't want to listen to even the most basic logic that there is clean coal technology in South Africa. Who doesn't want to listen to the logic that we can pursue on a base load, a base load of clean coal and gradually integrate the renewable energy, the liquefied the, uh, natural gases, and even nuclear sources of energy in a manner that is fiscally neutral, and only wants to pursue the renewable energy, which for ESCOM purposes has proven to be dysfunctional now. And, 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 and we want to understand where does this thing come from because he doesn't listen to even his colleagues who are saying that you can't just recklessly replace the base load of cold, clean coal because the CSIR has developed clean coal technologies. If the concern was about the environment, there are clean coal options that can be developed and, and, and implemented here in South Africa to continue to provide sustainable and dependable energy. Because even this industrialization that we're talking about will not go anywhere if we do not have a reliable and dependable energy supply. Right. So we want to see what are these political opportunistic influences on Cyril Ramaphosa. Maybe when we go to court, we argue for the unsealing of those statements, the bank statements, we'll be able to determine the extent at which our policies and the direction of government is being informed by the people who have put a president in their pockets. Right. Still the deputy president of uh, the Economic Freedom Fighters, Floyd Shivambu, in a wide-ranging conversation around issues that are, of course, uh, a concern to us as a nation, uh, but also concern to them as a political organization and members uh, of society. Taking your questions and uh, your thoughts uh, tonight uh, in a moment. Before we get to more of the questions, Floyd, I want to ask uh, uh, around the issues of... Uh, uh, governance. I mean, is it still your approach as the economic freedom fighters to uh, find expression in all corners of uh, uh, the country without actually getting hold of at least one and attempting to govern and actually testing uh, your ideas? I mean, wh where are you in, in 2021? Look, we are going to campaign and put up a very huge fight in the local government elections, and we are going to win some of the municipalities. I think we've demonstrated that capacity in 2016 when the EFF was just three years old. We were able to hang a lot of strategic municipalities here in South Africa. There was no outright winner in Ekorulini, in Tswane, in Nelson Mandela Bay, in Rustenburg, in Mitsimahulu, in Tabazimbi, in Mudimule. In, in Johannesburg because of the EFF. And, and, and we took a correct decision then not to participate in government, but utilize our, 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 our king making power to fight for the benefit of workers. That included the insourcing of workers in Johannesburg and Tswane, uh, mostly who were being paid 2,500 salaries, majority of them now have got salaries that are above 7,000 rand with proper benefits as workers. And, and we, we now have got adequate capacity organizationally, politically, and in terms of governance 
to could provide government to the people of South Africa. That is why when we take over municipalities in the elections, whether they are this year or next year or 2023, we are going to then demonstrate to the people of South Africa that we can have a much more progressive government that yeah. focuses on localization, that prioritizes people. That is not about quick enrichment of politicians through tenders. Yeah. That, that responds far much quickly to the demands of our people. That is what will define an EFF government. And of course, we are more than ready to, to, to provide decisive government. We have demonstrated that without occupying government positions in the areas where there were no outright winners. Now, talking about the places where there were no outright winners, when uh, the mayor, which you yourself say you worked very well with, Mayor Mashabo was taken out of Johannesburg. You were confident that uh, you will govern Johannesburg. What happened? We contested for elections of mayor in Johannesburg and members of the DA went to vote with the ANC and then the ANC won the mayorship of Johannesburg. And then they, of course, assembled a huge coalition of IFP and of even criminal organizations to constitute a government in Johannesburg. So we contested to be mayor of Johannesburg, but we were not voted. And because we believe in a democratic process, we accepted that we'll continue as opposition in the city of Johannesburg. We, we, we expressed the intention to contest in uh, Tswane. Uh, then that process was frustrated because of uh, the manner in which the ruling party that time handled the issues there. We put a candidate in Nelson Mandela Bay, and we 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 were we lost by three votes when when the current mayor was was elected. So we 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 we, we are now ready to be government, and we know that we are ready to be government. That is why, whenever there's an opportunity to provide government, we field candidates as the EFF to take government to provide services to our people and make sure that governments. Are properly run. That is what we are, and that is the position that we are in now. Okay, what do we expect? Uh, I mean, in your view, tomorrow from the budget uh, speech, more empty pots and uh, empty uh, promises. Uh, there's also a question around the downsizing of government. In fact, Dosini in Stellenbosch is asking this question. I'd like to get a view of Mr. Shivam Shivambu to elaborate on his views about the non-increase of government employees' salaries for five years. Is it a wise decision to be dictated? by the finance minister without intervention of labor or minister of public administration. I, I we don't think that there must be downsizing of any government. Like I think government must instead be repurposed to have internal capacity to perform its own functions. So if you were to assess all the procurement laws of government now, they literally outsource everything, like literally everything else. If they, they, they want to, to build schools, they have to outsource that to tenderpreneurs or to people who are involved in the tender processes. If they want to deal with professional services, they outsource virtually everything else. Our view is that don't downsize the government, repurpose it, build internal state capacity to perform your own functions. But we're not expecting anything major from Mr. Tito Mboweni, because he is just an instrument, a useful idiot in the hands of the new liberal controllers who tell him against economic science that you cannot cut budgets with the hope that you're going to meet your debt obligations. Instead, if you want to meet your debt obligations, you need to expand more so that there is greater economic activity your revenue base is expanded. There is a bigger number of taxpayers. That is how you deal with the debt crisis instead of austerity measures, which he has been imposing since he was, I don't know, like unthinkably appointed as a minister of finance. So there's nothing major that we're expecting from Tito Mboweni tomorrow. We listen to him and we'll give a comprehensive response after he has spoken in parliament. Now, I know you've said, uh, I mean, uh, there are lots of speculations, uh, some of which you, you do not want to entertain, particularly around the, the visit to, to, to Mkandla, uh, for example. Do, do, do you see it as any contradiction at all in terms of uh, the economic freedom fighters when your leader is going to, to Mkandla? Uh, having also said, I mean, you campaigned a lot 
to get the former president out of power. There's no contradiction. Where is the contradiction then? There's yourself, what, which contradiction do you see? What conversation are you Let's having with, 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 with what conversation are you having with a man that you did not want to see him in power? A leader that let us comply with the rule of law. Look, we, he was is not in power now. What is contradictory by saying, please comply with the institutions of democracy that have been established? If you do not win at this phase, there is always review mechanisms and other levels that you can pursue. What is contradictory about that? So anyone who thinks that the, the, there is any contradiction is foolish. The problem, though, is that the establishment in South Africa, they always prefer a situation where Black people are stratified. They, they, they are not united on any issue. They do not talk single-handedly on any issue because they know that Black unity is going to undermine the white supremacy and the undermine the white control, capitalist control of the economy. So every time they see black people gathering anywhere, even if it's few people, they are scared. That is why under apartheid, their instrument of oppression was to legalize all forms of black people gathering, uh, particularly those that have got political power and have got some, 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 some following in terms of uh, right. the politics that they stand for. There right. is absolutely nothing contradictory that the commander in chief did. Did I, that with I'm, our knowledge. I'm, I'm going to come, I'm gonna come in there because we are completely out of time, but I do appreciate the answer and appreciate you indulging us and giving us the time tonight. That is the deputy president of the Economic Freedom Fighters there, Floyd Shivambo. Because of time, we're going to have to leave it there.